Oh, so what do you, what do you make of, um, was there any change that you read into yesterday in, uh, Okay. Um, All right. Let me, let me walk you through this. I was going to blog last night. I'm tired. It's just some, uh, so much friggin' nonsense. Um, okay. Yeah. Now, if I ask you, what did, what did the Fed chair say the real unemployment rate was? I didn't hear it. You didn't hear? I didn't. That's one thing I didn't hear, and I didn't read okay. it yet. Okay, so I Everything don't. Else I paid attention to. I do, I don't watch. Uh, I'm media whatsoever. I, I I didn't even turn it on yesterday because I went right to the YouTube and watched and listened. Okay, I read the statement myself and waited for the press conference. So, Steve Leisman asked a question about assets being overvalued. Yes. All kinds of discussion from that. Uh, and he, he wound up answering, interestingly, about, he came to say in his estimation, this is why rates were gonna say low and, and asset prices by his measure, uh, let me give you, uh, there's, not, there's not really that much leverage used in the banking and non-banking system. And he thinks that uh, financial st uh, stability is in a moderate phase across the whole gamut of financial issue. And he has no jurisdiction over, uh, over non-financial um, lenders. Okay, did everybody hear that? Yes. So he's dodging all kinds of stuff. He doesn't want to, but he he then breaks it down where he talks about that the real unemployment rate. And for me, now I don't listen. Maybe Eastman said it, but how was the screaming headline is beyond me that the real unemployment rate is ten percent? Oh, now, he actually said that. He actually he said, said that. Oh, he said that. How now, did I miss that? Now. And you can go back and, and fact check me for all those you know, who live in that realm. Go ahead. Uh, but here's what I say to that. How is that yeah. the headline to come out of all of this? Fed chair says unemployment, real unemployment rate is 10% because that's what gives the Biden administration its whole uh, policy here. It's whole domestic economic policy. So now he's just said it. Ought to have been, and I say, I stress ought, ought to have been the headline. So I'm sitting here shaking my head going, wow, I listen to all this other crap. Uh, the famed uh, New York Times, of course, coming out with, you know, what, what's their first question? And my daughter told me, don't be too hard on her. He, she knows the journalist and she says, there's no way that was her question. That's from the editors. Of course, it's GameStop. Seriously? I couldn't believe that. First of all, anybody who, who knows the Fed, okay? Anybody who with a modicum of intelligence knows that a Fed chair would never answer that because they can't. A single stock, you can't comment on a single stock. We're ridiculous. And that's what his answer was. Then she asked the actual good question about, you know, again, uh, they all seem to be picking up on the uh, question of uh, financial stability and what tools does the Fed have? It's interesting that Powell goes right to the area, which I find more than passing interest, by the way. He goes right to the area, which, which was the Greenspan answer. Well, you can't really raise interest rates because if you raise interest rates to stem uh, uh, over exuberance, you're gonna wind up crushing the economy and that's the old method. And that's basically what, what he said. So I, first of all, I thought it was the worst press conference ever because he's, you know what? He really doesn't have anything to say, and he just keeps reiterating the same crap. And it just gets, I think, the Fed deeper into, you know, it's a proverbial hole that they keep digging for themselves. So, he, you know, he was the one who promoted a press conference after every, after every meeting. I think it's a gigantic, gigantic mistake, my opinion. And it showed it yesterday. I, I really thought it was pathetic. 
So, I mean, I got copious notes, not that there was copious notes really. And he, he really laid some bad groundwork. And now they're looking to the world. Well, we can't raise rates because there are, I'm quoting again, disinflationary forces on a global macro basis. Globalization is one, the effects of globalization, a glut of savings and technology. So these are where they, they stand. So it's the ultimate counterfactual that they created for themselves. I, you can see my frustration is so great with this. And then the market's reaction because I don't know what the hell we're looking for at anymore. But this Fed is going nowhere, nowhere. I, I don't even think, again, I come back to my operative question. Now he says that the real unemployment rate is 10%. My question gains even more pertinence because I, you know, now I readjusted it down to, uh, well, what if it's six percent unemployment and four percent inflation? It's just they're they're caught on a in a trap here. And then the ECB was without chirping yesterday beforehand, which I thought was kind of interesting. Were they trying to put more pressure on the Fed? That's what I thought as I listened to all that conversation coming out of Europe, which was ridiculous about even going further negative. And I looked to see the way the markets react. And then all, tell me why the silver jumped today. I know people are gonna tell me they're shorts. And I know I saw the story come out yesterday. So you have a, I'm, I'm gonna put up a 10 minute bar and look at right on key to at seven o'clock uh, Chicago time in that time period. Look what happened. It, it is really, it's where it jumps at. It's sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and then boom. So, I mean, we've had a lot of crazy stuff going on in these markets. Uh, and now, I guess anybody who's short anything has to be a little nervous, right? Because they're coming after you. And they're doing it in a very methodical way, so. In what way? What do you mean? They're doing it in a very methodical way. What's the next step? Well, you look at the stocks that they went after over this week, yeah. right? With GameStop and, uh, you know, uh, AMC, Nokia. Yeah, you know, it costs headphones. I mean, come on. Uh, and even a stock that I'm involved in where I know that there's significant shorts, Albertsons, 47, you know, it had a, a very high short and they're making money in a good company. So what's not vulnerable here? Well, I'll tell you, especially when you find companies that, you know, this, this whole game is in order for you to be short, you know, these big hedge funds, they have to go borrow the stock. Once the stock starts being pulled away because uh, for several reasons and they can't get stocks to short, the game is basically over because the cost of borrowing the stock soars and the short no longer makes any sense. So it becomes a... Um, a, uh, a feedback loop of great power. So now people who are short are, are nervous. And why the gold, to me, the gold should have rallied $50, $60 yesterday after I listened to that press conference. I, I said that yesterday afternoon. The one thing about that break that bothered me, bonds caught a bid, um, 10 year caught a nice bid. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Under 1%. Gold didn't move. And okay. that baffled me. Okay. So let's get into that. Now, can you, you got it? Can you have the ability to put up uh, Bloomberg uh, Commodity Index? Yeah. Okay. Put it up. Put up a weekly. Where how is it? Become. Yeah, I got it. I, oh, here it is. I got it. All right. Put up a weekly with the 200 moving average. <coughs> oh, gosh. Can you guys see this? Oh shit, it exploded on my screen. All right. I got the weekly up. Okay. What's the 200 week moving average? I, I don't have it. Okay. Well, it's above the 200 week. But you see where that is? 71, yeah. Something near 80. We're at March, we're at January 20, we're at, we're at, oh my God. Okay. 
Go back a year. How far is it to March? No, it's exactly a year. The week of January uh, uh, 21st, uh, 2020. Yeah, I'm here. And that's the onset of COVID coming to concern of the markets. And you see the dramatic drop. At exactly almost to the tick, 81, uh, 81 spot, 82.40 was the high. Okay. Almost to it. And then it just started to fall apart. Okay. And so the 200 week moving average on a continuation chart is 79.70. So we're above it. <laughs> this is really important because I think that the gold broke yesterday with the, with the equity. Well, the equities, I think, just got a little bit tired and, you know, and there was so much insanity in the market. I know what I thought too, yeah. But people were hearing all the negative news out of Europe with the COVID, and, you know, that, oh, the next round. And the market was, was almost, you know, because they sold everything off. So the metals got sold off. The dollar rallied. This mm -hmm. playbook from February through, I would say, mid April of last year. So all I'm cautioning is that was an interesting playbook. And what, what did the Fed and everybody else have to do? They got more aggressive on their liquidity ads in order to... Mm -hmm. It was important because you were having some real solvency. Those were not liquidity issues. Those were solvency issues that they were that all the central banks were dealing with. Where do they go from here? And the markets are really not responding. That's why I'm watching the Bloomberg Commodity Index and a few other things. Because yesterday was, oh shit, we're you know, this is going to be a mimic of where we were. Maybe maybe they're right. But I'm being I'm not. I'm watching a few indicators. And that's why to me, because you know, remember what they did in that period with the onset of COVID when people really got scared and nervous about what was going on in the world, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see what takes place here. And again, I'm responding, where does the Fed go? If the other goddamn unemployment rate by his admission is really 10%, where do they go? This is exactly what I've talked about for for 12 years in the block, 11 years in the block. It's, you don't buy gold because of inflation. Nope. That's such a fallacious argument. And for 11 years, it's been right, that argument. It is absolutely, but you know what? If that's the headlines and the narratives they wanna take, uh, what, is, what is WSB, by the way? Somebody's, somebody's talking about WS, I don't, I'm not in the Twitter world, so what is that? W, WSB is wall, what, what they call Wall Street Bets. That's where all the people um, on Reddit, you know, which is another uh, forum where all of these people from all over the world have come together to buy these stocks, GameStop, AMC, BlackBerry. My son, Danny, 21-year-old kid, the, the one out in uh, the ski bum out in Vail. Yeah. Um, you know, is he, he's been he's been learning how to trade for a while with me. Now he's out there yeah. just skiing. Yeah. This has got him all charged up. So if it's got him all charged up, Wall Street bets on Reddit. Okay. Then it you know all uh, all of these millions of kids that are dumping their stimulus checks into these stocks based upon um, as far as I understand, I read. I'm you know I'm early fifties. I what do I know? Based upon these plat these chat rooms and platforms. Uh, you know, they're coming together and doing that from there, I guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. I just, you know, had to, I, I should be more in the know with that, but you know, that's not the way, you know, I try to, to remain outside of that because that's the way my thought process works. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things I do have to pay attention to. Now, let me raise another issue. The Chinese have been doing things here that are interesting. Oh boy, I couldn't. Yes, I was going to ask you that. Yes, go. They're raising. They're draining liquidity with the with the with the uh, yuan at really strong levels. 
totally antithetical to the way that the PBOC has operated over the last 10 years, where when they would, you know, when they would get a little nervous that the currency was too strong, they would start adding liquidity to the system to try to push it a little lower. So this, this to me confirms my suspicions that commodity prices are as high as they are because it's the Chinese that are stockpiling all that they friggin' can. Yeah. Because why else would you why else would you be pushing your currency higher at these levels? You know what I mean? What's your incentive? Why? Grains, uh, all of the grains uh, uh, limit bid last week. You know those limit moves. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but. But as I, you know, I talked about it with with Judd's uh, group and uh, Andrew Perry, and we talked about this interesting article early on in the week. I think it was Monday in the FT or Tuesday that the Chinese were buying record amounts of Australian wheat. Now, this comes at the same time that the Chinese. You know, uh, media has only talked about, you know, uh, sanctioning the Australians for their vituperative speech and, uh, you know, so what is going on in this world? And that's what I'm concerned with. I, you know, what games, I, I'm not going to play in that arena. You know, if I catch one of these stocks because I happen to own it and it's one of the shorts in play, God bless me. And, you know, and I will know how to take my profits. I, I guarantee you what, way early. But as I was talking with my good friend, Mickey, who's one of the great traders and, and great women, not that I don't, you're either a great trader or not. I don't care whether you're black, white. Same. How's she doing? She's doing great. Good. No, she, she's 88 years, 89 years old. No, and she's still trading? She is fabulous. She's an amazing woman. She is fabulous. So we were talking quite a bit because she's a blog reader and she's really, picks up on things and she and I said, Mick, you hit home runs. I always hit doubles. You know, we were laughing about it. So uh, <laughs> and I said, but as Leo has always said to me, you know, because one day I was just shaking my head on the floor going, oh, I missed that. Rest of the movie says, yeah, I know. You've done so bad taking your profits too early. And I thought, and, uh, okay, you're right. <laughs> so, Mickey, Mickey is Mickey Norton is is maybe one of the finest, well certainly the first um, of the great women traders in the world. Oh, God, yes. Oh, yeah. Beyond, beyond the king, and really. And, and just a great thinker. You know, I talked with Mickey quite a lot. We, we do a lot of discussions about things. So great respect for her, uh, her acumen. And she really thinks things through in a very, yeah, really, one of, my, one of my favorite people. I, you know, again, up in the morning and you think about the people you know and you met in life, She's, yep. you know, I, I, I my, really, I, and, I, and I, I, I'm not going, I don't wear my religion or what I think about religion on my sleeve. I try to wear it in my heart and on my heart because that dictates the way I act. Yeah, I'm in. I, I don't need an image. I, my actions are my image and I, and I try to live by that. But I am truly to say blessed by just the type of people I've met in my life and, and have been able to, to, to see it. You know, I, you know, my favorite poem is If by Rudyard Kipling. And that line about, you know, being able to uh, kings and uh, and be and not to lose the common touch as the line goes. I, I always believe that's, you know, then you are a man. And, you know, and I think that's right. Cause my parents taught me, don't ever be impressed by those you keep your company with, you know, be impressed by the by the things that you do for others. You know, and, uh, I've been really lucky and fortunate in my life to, to be raised by people who stress that to me. So, but I am blessed by the people I, I've 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 had the ability and opportunity to meet people that are just phenomenal. And phenomenal. And, and Ira, I I benefited from the way that you were raised as well. And everybody in this group is uh, just because we, by extension, I've always gotten to, to I've always, you know, I've expressed this to you many times, uh, feel that way about the people I've met and you're at the top of that list. Uh, and by extension, everybody in this group, everybody that you've come across in your career and in your life, um, we're all benefiting from that just in these conversations. And thank you for taking the time out. 
as it should, by the way. Yes. As it should. I, I have to tell you. And I'm going to tell you what, and it's paid it back. You know, we raised a lot of money for, for Santa Mike this year. Yeah, we did. Total, but it's significant. And that's another way that it gets paid back. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot him because he sent me a gift yesterday. <laughs> And I'm going to enjoy it because my wife says I always have to learn to enjoy that people want to, you know, also and have a right to be able to give back to you. I said, okay, I got it. Sure. Um, but I really, I, it, it's been unbelievable, but it does, it, you hear my frustration. So I don't go into Wall Street bets. I, you know, I know that they have an important and, and it's important for people to pay attention to it. You know, no question about it. So that's where this all lies. Uh, and the China issue is a serious issue, by the way. I think it's another one that has gotten way underplayed this week. And it needs to, because that should be the operative. What are the Chinese doing? Are they trying to make nice with Biden? You know, something is definitely going on here and it's into Chinese New Year. But I'm, I'm a believer that it has to do Again, if you're shifting your economy, and I and I and I uh, cite the great work of Michael Pettis, who teaches economics in Beijing, but who's written several great books about it, and he talked about the need, and he's been on this theme for 15 years, the need for the Chinese to eventually shift their economy from a export model, which they're following the Japanese and the other Asian tigers to you know, a stronger currency and, and changing to a much more domestic uh, consumption-based economy. So it bears watching because that's what may have the greatest impact you know, on, on the commodity price. And I've been, you know, I've been out, as you know, I got out of uh, all my free port, my last of uh -huh. at 3031. I didn't buy it back yesterday. It was, but I bought more Glencore. So I, I'm, I, I still think this is a play. I bought more Bungie, uh, Archers. I, I've been out right at these levels. So it's, you know, there's nothing here. But I think that if that story is right about China, it continues to play out. And Robert will, will, will speak to that. And, uh, you know, so there are these things that are absolutely in play. And you, you have to be on top of them because Again, what do we get sidetracked by? The game stops. And, and, and to yeah. me, that, that's not, I'm a global macro guy. You right. know, I marvel at it. I look at it. It's important, you know, but I, I can't, if I take my eye too, too far off the picture that I'm watching, I'm going to start doing stupid things. So listen, as I say, treat it as a trade and make all the money you friggin' can. And in the same way I'm looking at that's the only way I'll only trade the yield curves as I've stressed. You cannot, and we saw the rally, right? Last uh -huh. week when I was on with you guys, we, I said, you could Beautiful. Trade the bonds from the short side, but I wouldn't own it. Beautiful. I would not, that would, a short side in the bonds would not be an investment for me. No, I, I've been, I've been pulled. I, I ended up getting on a little bit too early. I got out, um, I got out of my bonds Sunday night going into yesterday, and I should have stayed long. But, yeah. but um, Ira, what do you think that what do you think the the implications of of um, for the dollar? What do you think of China moving from from a more export to a more consumption based economy means for means for China uh, uh, for the yuan on a global basis and for the dollar? You know to to you know bump up a little again a bit against conspiracy theories. You know what you have learned well, Matt. That's right because it'll build up the Japanese bond market. Because yeah. it's more domestic oriented. So you don't have, you know, they're just not hoarding. Now they have to finance a lot of things. Uh, they're huh? financing everybody else. But it'll shift a little bit. And Yuan will then become, you know, as long as the Chinese are importing a lot of stuff, people will be dealing in Yuan. It, there's a, it, it's a fabulous question. It's a fabulous question. It, it's, it, it's a question that I'm, you know, mulling and chewing on all the time now. Uh, and, and somebody asked me, as you know, to put this morning. I got uh, where I he said be short with your answers, and I I was short um, about. And here's the thing. He said, "Where do you think the dollar is?" Just your question. I think the dollar is lower 
in three years because, you know, nothing stays the same forever. Uh -uh. The United States came out of World War II. They set the agenda for the world. I'm a, I'm a big reader of, uh, again, Graham Allison, who I think is the, the best political economist. I'm sorry, the best political scientist in the country. Uh, his articles, you don't have to read the book. You can read the articles. He's written enough articles on the Thucydides trap. And I believe that it, when the world runs right, you will make w room for other countries to be uh, a part of the more dominant uh, players. And that's, it, it just has, I don't believe in, in ridiculous nationalism. You know, where uh, I, I just don't believe in it. I don't, I don't believe the world necessarily, it doesn't mean that I'm, you know, a, a fan of the UN. I think the UN is an archaic uh, institution that is there to serve the people who are part of its bureaucracy. I think the same about uh, others, you know, it's, there's a lot of that goes on. Uh, do I think it could be uh, more important? Yeah, they could cover issues. I think the environmental is gonna be with us. I think the green revolution is, is real, not like the green revolution in the seventies, which was producing food, although this will probably meld with it. There are things that are done on a global nature because we're all in the same world. We, we all live within the, a global ecosystem. Now, do I think that the world via China and India and you know things that were really put upon, and people minimize this, but it's in their mindset, it's very real. Hey, you suck the life out of us, you colonial masters, and not asking us to, to have to step up to this, but we can't afford that technology because you drain the wealth out of us. And that is their operative mindset. Now you can scoff at it all you want, doesn't matter. The Chinese do not forget. And you can listen to them. And again, I always come back to the supposed conversation between Henry Kissinger and Joe and Joe and Lai in 1971, when Kissinger was meeting with him to set up the, uh, the Nixon trip to China. And when Kissinger supposedly, you know, there are people who, and even Kissinger, hints, but Kissinger, you know, was sucking on his tits so hard because he was so amazed that he was standing there with Joe and Lai, a guy who was not just a threat, he was he was in the game. Kissinger only comments about the game. You know, this is the difference yeah. between Al Michaels and uh, uh, Walter Payton. Um, who and who? Walter Payton or something? No, yeah, no, I know. No, no. Let me. One of my favorite guys uh, from from the Minnesota Vikings, who's a who's a judge who I I love. He was one of Alan Page. Oh, yes. and, well, Alan Page is a brilliant man. If you listen to him talk. He is, a, he's, you know, he went to law school while yeah. he was, I, I have great respect. I mean, he could have laid back at that time and said, yeah, but he, he, and I love listening to him. It was, you know who else was, um, what's the name who played for the Eagles in the past? Oh, uh, what, Reggie, what, Reggie White. No, the lineman, the defensive lineman, uh, yeah. Reggie White. Reggie White was a brilliant, I mean, I saw a, a thing, you know, with uh, Charles Kowal, an interview. Reggie White before, and I was so sad that he died. He died so young, but a brilliant guy. He really. He I, both, I met him. I met him in in um, his uh, his rookie year, my yeah. senior year in high school. We uh, um, and what, I tore the my knee up. The De La Salle Meteors? No, no, yeah. When I after I tore my knee up playing for the Meteors, I yeah. we both had our knees done by the same by the same. Uh, um, uh, orthopedic surgeon in Elmhurst. He, he was stationed there. He was based yeah. on Elmhurst. I can't remember his name, but yeah. I'm sitting in there and there was this big, I mean, he was huge. And I was a big kid then too. And we just started talking football and he was just drafted and, and you know, it was Reggie White. And <laughs> I followed him all, all the way through. Alan Page was, he had a, he had a great career with the Vikings and also oh. a great career with the Bears. Later half of his career while he's going to law school. Great. I mean, these are great these are uh -huh. great stories, you know, and it shows you, you know, I have such respect for these people. I, Reggie White, when they, that Charles Corral, 
Reggie White was, he had no idea how deep, you know, you, you always want to look at the surface because that's all anybody does. But you know what? Joe and Lyle was in the game. He was a, he he was on the long march. You know, Kissinger can only uh, theorize about it. But and Kissinger, but when Kissinger asked him a question, supposedly, and he, Kissinger plays with it. He doesn't deny it, and yet he's a little cautious with it. He says he said to Joe and Lyle, who was Mao's confidant. In fact, I'm reading uh, right now Ezra Vogel's uh, biography of Deng Xiaoping. Ezra Vogel just died at 90. Um, so he, Joe and Lai asked him, he, or, or Kissinger asked Joe and Lai, what did he think about the French Revolution and, and its impact upon the world? And Joe and Lai says, it's too early to tell. Well, oh. well, yeah, I mean, we, we chuckle, but oh. the Chinese have a long mindset. Colonial, my point is this. The colonialism and the rape and plunder that went on in China. I just finished reading The Breakup of China by uh, Lord Charles Beresford that was written in 1898. These are serious issues that the Chinese don't forget. Listen, the Chinese and Japanese are still at it. Uh -huh. Figure this out. And there's ill will. And people look at it and go, huh, how can that be? You know, they do things. It's like when, when people, you know, I, I, I go, it makes me nuts when the uh, more radical Islamic members talk about uh, uh, thank you, Ian Jones, I love that. Uh, when, 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 when they bring up the religious aspects and how it directs, the American mentality and the Western European mentality is to scoff at it. Oh, who thinks about religion? It's real to them. These are not just words. We are morons. We, we as a society, because we don't take them at their words. That's the problem with the world. We think that everything is dictated by our concept. Mm -hmm. That what we think is right and good. You know what? There's a lot of people with other thoughts in this world. The Chinese are still, you know, that's why I'm a bimetallist. You know, it's a little late today with the silver, of course, uh, but we'll have our opportunities. But the Chinese were on the silver standard when everybody else was on the gold standard. And the birds started with the opium war to debase the, the damn silver and really punish China, just for the record. You think that they forgot that? No. Nope. They forgot that not I a don't. second. No. Not a second. Only we forget that. Because you know what our mindset is? Three friggin' weeks. Putin and Netanyahu and many others have learned the Americans can only focus for three weeks. Beyond that, and I don't even know if it's three weeks anymore, they go on to the next issue. There's no depth to anything. Everything's 240 characters now or less. Wait, hold on one second. Levi's was fed. No, she didn't eat. I took her food and gave it to him. And she's been walked, so she might eat because she pleaded. She said, I took her out for a walk. Okay, sorry. Sorry. What? Ian said that's really interesting. Relevant mine used to be part of the UK trade envoy to China. He was telling me last week that as soon as the UK flag went down in Hong Kong, the Chinese felt humiliated by the UK as a colonial power. He was saying that he felt yeah. the Chinese were by their tent. Oh, yeah. This is, you know, Ian, this is fascinating. Once they, when, when um, uh, I don't want to ask Ira about this one. Okay, know, go ahead. I'm okay. Back. What was, so uh, I, I just re now read uh, Ian's um, uh, comment, yeah. you know, so China, God, the implications of this are just huge. And I've been, I've been, I've been asking about it. You remember we had that conversation in Judd's room early on um, about when, when uh, uh, the, the Shanghai gold, uh, uh, the, the Shanghai oil contract came about, right. it looked like it was exchangeable, you, you know, oil right. for gold. 
Right. Um, China has been accumulating massive amounts of gold, um, mm -hmm. uh, untold amount. Nobody can really quantify or how much, and uh, as is Russia, which is strange. But so with with China's long term view on things, and that's what a what an incredibly interesting comment about the the French Revolution, and coupling with 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 what you're saying, uh, uh, with China's with the yuan being being. Um, accepted into the basket of um, SDRs, yeah. And this, all of the gold, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but what does this? Wh where does this end? It seems to me like China's got a. Here's my here's my point, Ira. It seems yeah. to me like China's got a clear path, whatever that may be. And and the U.S. has none. And 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 we have the Fed has no exit strategy. The Fed has no idea what in the hell they're doing. And. and and gold isn't reacting yet, although it's sustaining most of that rally that we had since 19, but or, uh, from eight, from the lows of 18 coming up into 19. But what is what does it mean long term for the United States and for the rest of the Western world? Well, I, it, see, again, in Graham Allison's point is if you make room for them, you can work together. If you only try to suppress them, then you're going to have conflict. You might wind up with conflict anyway, but you can, you know, there can be, if we're going to think in a global perspective, fine. Uh, and the world is, and you know, see, that's my problem with George Soros, because Soros has an open society on a global basis in which basically it has to be run uh, by a philosopher king. And I've read Karl Popper's work because after I read the, um, uh, alchemy of finance, I had to delve into where uh, Soros's thought process was coming from. And I hadn't really been familiar as much as the political philosophy I'd read with Karl Popper. I mean, I knew he was. So, you know, it's good to be the philosopher king. You know, it's almost just comes down to the, the platonic issue of philosopher king. And Soros loves a philosopher king as long as he's the philosopher king. Mm -hmm. So, but let's, China does have a plan and they are a top down. You know, we keep discussing this. You know, I remember one of the worst comments ever from Jim Cramer, uh, maybe three years ago, when he talked, or two years ago, when we were really going at it with China, he says, well, he understands that the US is pushing for a regime change. I nearly threw up what I ate that more. I said, what a moron. Oh my yeah. gosh. Re regime change, he said it, you, there's no question about it because you know, he spouts out whatever the hell he wants to spout out. Nobody remembers it. You know, it, if I say three weeks, his thought process is maybe three minutes. Uh, uh, along with Ted Cruz, I, I see that as Harvard Law School. If I had a Harvard Law diploma, I'd be burning it because uh, I don't need the diploma. I, I just need what I learned. Uh, right. But a lot of things going on. But that's a, China does have, a, they play the long game so to speak. And I love Ian's comments, okay? Because what Ian's saying, and this is what Deng Xiaoping said in 1979, 1980, as he was making the shift, again, the operative phrase of Deng Xiaoping, and I'm reading his biography now, it's, it's thick. Uh, uh, Ezra Vogel needed a little editor, I think. But Deng Xiaoping's view was, what, what was his, he, he said, I don't care if the cat is white or black, I mean, capitalism or socialism, as long as it catches mice. So, you know, the, those are like following up in, in Mao's, you know, Mao's Red Book, if you read those, and I've read it several times, there's great phrases in there. The East wind will prevail over the West, meaning that Asia will rise over, you know, it was, these are things that, aphorisms from Mao. Um, but Deng Xiaoping also, and I'm picking up on Ian, which was, Hide and bide, meaning as you're growing, hide, hide your strength, and then you bide your time. That was, and that's why Xi is being criticized within China now, as he's too arrogant. He's too arrogant because he's flexing too much of China. It's still time to lay low. Hide and bide. So I was kind of laughing. Uh, because what we did in America was Biden and Hyden. We we had Biden, but we hit him because you know they wouldn't let him come out. So Biden, Biden, that's funny. They I mean, still won't let him come out. 
it, I mean, if I was if I was writing the headlines for the New York Post, that would have been Biden and Hyden, you know, to take off. But that's awesome. Biden. What about um? Uh, oh shit. Yeah, that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, no, I can't think. Of, I, I I lost my my thought, but it was going back. Um, oh man, it was going back a few years just to kind of uh, set a proper perspective. It, it it really is, and and it'll come back to me. But it 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 is bothersome to me that we have um, we have no exit strategy. That um, uh, and, and that that it just seems like the U.S. is just kind of drifting in the wind without any real solid leadership. We've got we're we're factioned, we're divided, and um, a, a lot of a lot of talk, a lot of talk about unity, um, but you know a lot of double talk after it too. A lot of passive aggressive double talk. Um, well, go let, ahead. Let me, you know, but. Powell was adamant yesterday that, that it's way too early to think about exit. Well, they have 12 years of no exit strategy. Yeah. And it was very interesting to me that while, and that was a question from Mike McKee at uh, Bloomberg. Oh, he discussed regulation T, which I thought was interesting. Oh, no, you know, that they weren't good. That's the margin issue that the Fed does have control over. And then he said, there's no tapering timeline. Uh, and Mike McKee asked him, can you stop this when it is time? And, and he said, honestly, the whole focus on exit is premature. That scared me. Right. So now let me explain. What he didn't talk about was the Powell pivot. Interesting. He talked about uh, Bernanke, what we learned from that. What about the Powell pivot, you asked? Uh -huh. And they let him go because there was it. He had no exit strategy. He tried. He thought he had one. With the what Druckenmiller refers to as the double, uh, as the double shotgun approach, you know, we've talked about this many times. And Santelli and I on July tenth, two thousand and eighteen, had the same discussion because long before uh, Druckenmiller, I said you do one or the other, do one or the other. But to do both, you, you're taking on a lot, and you don't know the impact of it. And that of course, and then of course, he couldn't wait to pivot, so he's scared out of his mind right now. And, and the fact that he's using, again, and he kept referring to it, the disinfl disinflationary forces on a global macro basis. He said it. I'm not putting these words in his mouth. He mm -hmm. said it. It's interesting how all of a sudden now they're invoking the global environment. You know, for 40 years, I've criticized the Fed because to me, the Phillips curve was flawed in its uh, assumptions that it was much more important, domestic conditions were far more important than global conditions. And I, I'm a global, I'm a, I'm a global analyst. I'm a global macro person. This has been my life's work since I was in graduate school, doing my research uh, on uh, multinational corporations and the way they operated in the global arena. So I mean, I've looked at this and. The Phillips curve has always bothered me because I see the world and I see why corporations move around the world. And once you free up capital, that movement became much easier and much more robust, by the way. Uh, Ira, my, my question came back um, okay. to my mind. So, and, and, and again, this, I don't know if, if this is anywhere on, uh, I always have to qualify these things because I feel silly sometimes talking to you about this. All right. But in, in the hide and bide um, um, theme, the long game that China's playing, mm -hmm. in, in, in uh, um, the, the crisis of 08, it was, it was you know, I read where uh, Paulson had met with uh, his counterpart in China and had uh, begged them not to dump uh, all the treasuries that they owned on the open market. It, it would have crushed it would have just completely imploded the not just the 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 U.S. banking system but the Western banking system. Um, is, is is that? Am I off base there in that assumption? No. First of all, I just I thought it was stupid of Paulson to do that. By the way, I'm not not a fan of Hank Paulson. You know, we have yes. a way of we have a way of celebrating people, but 
somebody sent me a good friend of mine from who lives in Woodstock, New York, and he didn't know. He just sent it to me to look at. Uh, there's a front line that w appeared in 2009 during the, you know, right after the, the height of the great financial crisis, there was a front line on PBS with Brooks Lee Bourne. I'll send it to you, hold on. Yeah, please. Now he didn't know, he didn't know what I knew. So he just sent it to me, he says, you gotta see this because it's it has relevance. And, and I'm only bringing it up because of Paulson. And I thought that was a crazy, crazy thing to do. Uh, first of all, they weren't gonna, it wasn't in their interest to do it. So I don't know what they're thinking about. Yeah, they, 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 China doesn't want to be the, the, the world standard bearer any, you know, any more than the U.S. seems to want to give it up. Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, it's, it's even, it goes deeper than, but, uh, you know, yeah. I, why would you do that? All you would do is harm your own assets, right? Well, I, I right. And, I, and that's my point. So China, China held on. They they're hiding and biting, and now instead of instead of destroying the Western banking system and then you know coming to prominence and being the world standard bearer, it seems like China is moving into uh, as they moved into the SDRs, and and this is my thought, and I could you know, and I'm sure it goes way deeper than this, like as you said, but and I could be off base, but it seems like now China is is setting the stage, the world stage to come and work together with Western leadership along with maybe uh, the Russian Federation and, you know, and, and not have the US and, and her allies as the world standard bearer, but both of them together and, and moving, moving the world together. You know, I, 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 I could be completely out base. I don't know, but it seems to me like there's something afoot more than just uh, um, on a global basis more than making their their the the Chinese economy uh, a more um, consumption based um, economy. I, I think it's Help me here. <laughs> definitely going taking place. And look, it. I I'm not a binary person. To me, the world just doesn't break. Right. Yet you you become a binary person because you you're looking for simplicity in the world. You know. I, I just don't think the world is that simplistic. Uh, you know, and you, you can say, well, you, you know, uh, uh, yeah, it is. You're just, you know, you're trying to make it more complicated because it fits your uh, narrative. Okay. Well, don't partake in that narrative. I mean, you go about your binary fashion. And, and I felt that way during the Cold War. There was a whole lot of stuff going on in the world that if you were only paying attention to the U.S. and the Soviet Union, you missed a lot of what was going on. Yes. And and you're you're seeing it now because while the world was working on a containment basis, the Chinese and what was called the non-aligned, you know, once the Chinese broke the Soviet Union. Oh, by the way, the CIA missed that schism. Another fine, you know, they're good at listening in on people's phone calls. It's just the big pictures that they seem to miss. Um, uh, <clears throat> so I you know what the word, there's a lot of stuff and now the Chinese are really, you know, yeah, there's, I question some of the stuff they've done in Africa, uh, but they were involved in Africa when nobody, because there was nothing to be gained in Africa, except, you know, sustaining the colonial, uh, vengeance mm -hmm. because it fit the narrative of, of the containment policy of the U S. There, God Almighty, this is such a fascinating conversation. Um, uh, I'm, well, again, I'm good. Go ahead. I, again, it's because I stress that there's a lot more going on in the world. Yes. Binary views that people want to concern themselves with. There's a lot. And now I don't understand. So yesterday, uh, uh, what's his name? The new uh, Secretary of... Uh, of state uh, came out, you know, and he said, "Yes, uh, 
the Chinese were committing uh, genocide in Xinjiang with the Uyghurs. That's a big word to use. And oh my if gosh. Case, and if that's the case, what's your policy response? You can't come out and just say that. It's like drawing a red line in Syria and have no real policy response. Is there a move, um, uh, is there a move of foot? This may seem like it's totally disjointed, but but my, in my mind, in my Irish mind, it comes together. Um, is there a move afoot, Ira? You know, we hear a lot about uh, uh, central banks moving to a digital currency, and then also central banks moving to a digital asset-backed currency. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what we're going to get. I think we'll get a dig they're, they're really looking at it. And, you know, I've been, uh, <laughs> I've, I've been, um, Oh boy, February 25th, I'm doing a, a, a review of the four horsemen of the apocalypse from last year. Oh. Um, so with uh, Rosenberg, uh, Bianco and uh, Bookmer. Oh my gosh, I, that, that, was, that was the best, um, uh, um, that was the that best was, podcast I listened to last I'll year. I'll have to revisit it. Um, so, you know, these are all things, yes, Matt, these are great questions. It, and it really shows the the world is complex. Yes. Thank God it's complex. Because that, to me, that's my nuance and context, right? Is a complex yes. world. I think everybody's getting kind of sick of me talking about nuances and, <laughs> and context every day. <laughs> it's very funny. So again, I, I, I mean, and I don't know if I'm making the connections properly. But it just it just seems to me that that in this oh my gosh in this this uh, this incredibly complex um, world uh, globally macroly economically spiritually emotionally just all the way down into our homes as Ian was just talking about with the Chinese buying his kids private schools in in Wales yeah um, that the move. Uh, you know, we, we've got, a, I, you know, blockchain, I've done a lot of reading on and, and I, 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 blockchain is fascinating to me that I can see that, I can see the world moving towards that. Um, Bitcoin to me is a tradable asset. Uh, I, I don't, I don't, you know, that's it re really to me, it's a tradable yeah. asset and I've had some pretty good right. trades in it. Um, but the movement towards some sort of a sound money theory and, or some, uh, not theory, the movement towards a sound, some sort of a sound money basis, I suppose, um, coupled with China and the long game and the U.S. having a three-week outlook on things, or the Western world having a three-week out, outlook on things, seems to me like the, the, the world is shifting quickly and rapidly, and, um, uh, and oh, the vast majority of Americans are, are while they're focused elsewhere, all of this is happening and nobody's prepared for what the repercussions may or may not be. And I don't even pretend to begin to okay. know what they are. So you're very topical because now I just got headlines uh, from my guys on Slack. Uh, Bridgewater's Dalio calls Bitcoin one hell of an invention. Then he says Bitcoin could still lose most of its value, Dalio warns. Yeah. We're still looking at cryptocurrencies for two new funds. <laughs> but... Hey, that's capitalism. Nothing stands by itself. Anything that's a good idea, people are going to come and compete against. The whole basis of uh, creative destruction. But I go back to the piece I wrote last week. Governments, and it's been my stance for many years, and of course it's cost me money because I didn't trade it. I, uh, you know, we looked at the investment and I've talked about it, you know, for four or five years already. Uh, it's, it's interesting. And the blockchain aspect of it was even more interesting to me. Uh, but I warned that I always thought that, uh, that governments do not like competition and, this, and the sovereign nature of government is the ability to control their currency. End of story. So that made me nervous. And then when I heard Yellen and uh, Lagarde both singing from the same hymnal about it, 
and concerns about, you know, funny money as they call, you know, so I, I, I have my issues. So what can I say? Right. That's beautiful. That, that, that's exactly, that's what, that's where I was going with the governments don't, or that's, that, that crystallizes it for me. Governments don't like um, competition. competition. First of all, again, uh, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 5 of the U.S. <laughs> Constitution. Read it and tattoo it. Those of you who have tattoos, put it on your arm because it's very important. And they're, they're telling you, they're warning you. So go ahead and push it. You know what? I'm, I'll trade it both ways, but I will not. I'm not investing. Not yet. I have to see a whole lot more. But as I say, it'll be interesting to me if the Chinese come with a cryptocurrency backed by silver, part silver and part gold, and bring bimetallism back to the world. It'll be interesting. Or, or a bank core, which was the idea of uh, Keynes to have a to have a currency who's who had an underlying basket of commodities. That's what it interests me more with China. Is that where we're going? You know, this is all hypothetical, but I'm just watching sure. the world. And I'm trying to under, I always try to understand the world, probably too much and it prevents, you know, me making some trades that I ought to make. But on the other hand, it keeps me out of shit. And again, I always do trading. It's not always what I make, it's what I save. It, it, and that that is another thing that's lost on, on I think a whole generation of traders. It's not just what we make. It's 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 how we it's what we save. Oh my gosh, I talk about that all the time. How many traders have you and I? Uh, how many? I know thirty of them, and I, I can't imagine how many traders you know that have been ha, have made fifty million plus end up driving Uber. You know nowadays, or you know it's just because they don't learn that. They don't learn that. That's right. You know what? This is this is not a game to me. It's a business. No, I've always treated this as a bit. This is a business. I don't work at it as a hobby. Uh -uh. And whenever I've gotten a little bit lazy and not as focused, I've paid a dear price. So, oh God, I work at it. This is this is a forty. You everybody here gets the. You know, I'm not asking for your praise. That's not why I say this. Uh, but you get the benefit. And I'm happy to share it because it helps your questions help clarify my thoughts. This is a free lunch. Speaking of which, before before Ira goes, does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and let him rip because I'm going. I have to wait for the Connecticut uh, to get my hey. water filtration. Pax, yeah. I have one. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. James. James. Uh, 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 Ira, this is James Unger. James is a... Um, uh, I met him last year down at, in Naples with Anthony. Anthony's uh, golf outing, but you stiffed us up. <laughs> anyway, James is a rancher from uh, uh, Yuma, Colorado. He's My favorite people. I really, I had this with Rob. I have such respect for people who really, if I couldn't do this, I'd be, a, that's what I'd be doing, probably farming, because I, I like, I love that. I've done it in my life, you know, on a, but not a permanent basis. But so, James. I love that. If I, where, where are you at? Yuma, where? Colorado, Northeast Colorado. Northeast. Well, I've, driven, I've driven through there. My daughter did a stint at, uh, at uh, Colorado State. She was in journalism. She, she worked on the, on the uh, what do we call it, paper? Um, Legion. Fort Collins paper. So, oh, yeah, I love it. I, I really. So, and I, I, had a, I had a ski house down in uh, Aspen. Aspen. Edwards, Colorado. So I remember that big Colorado fan. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, uh, back in March and April, I was buying a bunch of physical gold and silver and the, and the place I did most of my buying from, I was talking to one of the, you know, higher up guys in that business. And he, he was telling me that JP Morgan is obligated to buy uh, like 17 metric tons a month until the second quarter of 2022 to fill their reserves to back their ETFs and whatever else they got going on. So, I mean, they're, he, he forecasted the price of silver being pretty hard, hardly suppressed by them, you know, while they fill up those physical reserves. Is that, I mean, do you know anything about that? Okay. So, you know, this, you know, James, I, 
I'm not a conspiracy, conspiracy guy because for me, for a conspiracy to work, it has to be a very small circle. And you have to be willing to kill the people who step out of line. <laughs> I, uh -huh. I hate because when when people when too many people learn and the, and in that, so I don't know. You know, I've heard this for a long time, and I don't know if you know. Uh, you know, just clear. You ever go on that website? Mindset. I don't think so. No. Okay, but the, I mean, and, and and Jim and I have a long history. I have great respect. Jim taught me a whole lot. Um, so this has been promoted at certain sites, you know, and that's why the markets you see, like this morning, classic case, right? There is, you can time this between six and seven o'clock central, central time. There is movement in the, in the metals markets. Usually they're pushing it down and a lot of people think it's the banks because they're trying to buy stuff and they can push the market down. I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I can't say that it's, there's no truth to it. I just don't know. And I've talked to people, you know, um, about certain aspects of it. And we saw it. And let me go back to March and April of last year. You remember some of the, you know, some of the stuff, actions in the metals market were insane because the spot price soared relative to the futures price because they were worried about exactly what you're asking, them making delivery. Remember when that happened? Markets were crazy. But some of that was due to the fact that you couldn't get, you know, airlines weren't flying internationally. And a lot of metal gets flown back and forth because when the vaults at the COMEX get low and people are taking delivery, you can squeeze that market and people had a fear that that was going on. Uh, you know, maybe, I, you know, maybe that's true that they're trying to fill their vaults. I just, I don't know. I just, somebody has been sitting on the metals market, but it could be that the Chinese stopped buying. You know, let me take the other side of that. You know, people, for, markets can go up and, and it takes a lot to push markets. I'm, and I'm not talking about GameStop and that nonsense. You're, hey, you're a rancher. You certainly know about prices going up and down, you know, what it takes to get beef prices up, right? You, there's no, there's no GameStop there, you know, and I've, and I, and I am where I've known enough people involved in the meat business. In fact, uh, I'll tell you, when I used to make the drive from Chicago to Colorado and I would go through Iowa and Nebraska and I would see the, the, um, the strength of Iowa beef, IBP. So I, I actually started accumulating IBP stock and they got bought out, but that was such a, an insider's game. They, they didn't let anybody make money and wound up in the courts. Um, but it takes a lot to lift those prices. Uh, but it takes people stop buying for prices, you know, they go down a lot faster. So whoever was buying in the gold market, yes, there's certainly somebody who is doing some accumulation. But I'm sitting on an article right here. I'll pull it up here. I, I have it printed out. I just have not gotten to it. It's from January 12th. And the headline, and it was from, I believe, it was a it was a Bloomberg article. Russia, for the first time, holds more gold than U.S. dollars. They had five. Wow. They had 583 billion in gold reserves, and only like 540 in dollars. So, I, I've been meaning to get to it. It's just there's been other things I haven't. So, there are natural buyers out there, and uh, there's just nobody. I don't think any. Again because they've sold this issue about um, inflation in gold. And, you know, and again, I'm not in the camp. I buy gold and I buy hard assets because I worry more about uh, central banking. Not that's, and the outcome of when central banks, you know, really lose control of the fiat currency world. That's my concern. So it's not the inflation concern, uh, but I, I don't, I, I can't, you know, I, if, any, if anything, I would give the Chinese who, if they are accumulating in the regions, well, at times, I'm sure it's in their interest to push the market down because if you're accumulating it. Because one of the things the China, I haven't seen them doing it. That's why I thought grain prices were going materially higher. <coughs> Previously, when the Chinese were buying, I'm going back seven, eight years, when, they, when the market started to get too far 
advance. It was a straight rally. The Chinese were really good at announcing that they were canceling uh, shipment, you know, uh, um, previously uh, loaded shit. Well, no, we're not buying. And the markets would adjust, and then all of a sudden prices would start heading back up. So I think the Chinese are various traders. And I don't mean as individuals, but as a consortium, meaning the country, when they have a policy, they're astute and they're not going to race themselves. Although now we haven't seen that. We haven't seen cancellation of shipments of beans in order to, to get the market down. So again, that makes the case. But you know what? Who's on the other hand, let me ask you the question. Well, so you would say that JB in that conspiratorial vein. The natural buyer at all times is J.P. Morgan, right? It's yeah, I guess you'd of, say so on the physical side. Yeah, it, it's just a matter of what price. And are, but if the Chinese don't let up on the market, or the you know, and I'm not even talking about the Indians, uh, meaning, I'm, and I'm talking about India, where gold has a seasonal pattern to it. Of course, coming into weddings, because uh, a lot of gold is you know made up of dowries. And uh, there is, and the Indians are consummate uh, gold consumers in that regard. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, but as somebody, as Peter Bookmar wrote about, if a Mickey Mantle rookie card can go for 5.4 as people search out assets, uh, I, I look for a hard, and, and the metals are hard assets with a 3,000, 4,000 year history of being a store of value for people who had wealth so, or, or who had wealth to protect. So, I, I mean, that's, that's the way that I see the world. I, 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 I don't know, maybe they are there. I, I don't have enough information to ever make that definitive statement. I, I'm not trying to dodge the question. I'm just putting it in terms that I don't understand. Okay, thank you. Appreciate your time. No, th thanks. And how's the uh, how's the ranching business? Uh, not good. Too dry out here. We need we need moisture. Yeah, and we need some prices too. This corn market ain't helping things. Do I, do, yeah, I know. Yeah, we, I was uh, I was talking about that with Rob. Cost of gain up 20, 20 cents. You know, in the feedlots over the past two months, that makes it pretty hard. Yeah, he, he was saying in Kansas they're paying over six dollars a, a bushel for corn because they're mm -hmm. working. Yeah, basis is crazy, especially depending on where you're at front range. You know, up there around Fort Collins and whatnot, it's I don't know. I think they're seventy over. Oh, but let me ask you a question: Can you feed now? Do you buy DSG to feed to to uh, the cattle? By what? By what? The distillers grain, you know, from when they do the ethanol. Yeah, you no, we we don't we that we have an ethanol plant here and local, but we don't at our feedlot. We don't use any distillers grains. It's kind of too unreliable on, you know, getting it shelf life and usability. A lot of guys do though. Now, are you making any money in the ethanol business? Uh, yeah, the ethanol plant has been good. Good, good. I, you know, I looked at it, I looked down in the Texas panhandle. There was a, uh, in 2005, I was looking at the, in fact, I was, I was such an idiot. I was trying to buy farmland. And I read up a lot about how this ethanol was gonna work. Cause first of all, I, I was never in favor, but I understand from farmers point of view, it's a very great positive, but I get nervous when people start screwing with the food chain. I think it's a very, and when you take food and convert it to energy, although you don't lose that much of it because of the distiller's grain. So, but I was driving around in uh, North, in, uh, I have to put my map, in Northwest Indiana, looking for, because I know you have to be within, because you can only transport it. You can't transport uh, ethanol by pipeline. It's either truck or train. So you gotta be by a railhead and so I was driving around, but it was 2005 and land in Northwest Indiana, you, you were competing with um, housing developers because uh, you know, the housing market was on fire. 
So I was driving around talking to farmers who were who had their land, you know, for sale. And I, and, uh, and they said, well, why are you interested? I mean, I had so many meetings. Um, it was great though, because I love talking to them. And they, I said, well, why? And they had asked me, why are you trying to buy farmland? I said, well, because with ethanol coming, I think corn prices are going to be higher. So I said, so I was trying to make deals instead of buying the land. Or I would buy the land and rent it back to them but they would make money too because at the time corn was trading around 280 to $3 a bushel. And I said, well, we'll put in cut, well, you do the farming, we'll own the land so you don't have that risk anymore. And if corn prices go to 320 to 350 to four, if I'm right, we'll give you a percentage of the, of the profits. So, they, so every time I sat down to make, close to making a deal, they go, if you're right, why am I selling? Forget. It. Don't need so you. I talk myself out of more deals. Was, oh my gosh, that's that great. Cool. I yeah, that, that, was, was, that was good timing on your on your end, though, Ira. Yeah, I saw it because you know there was a guy, Peter uh, Goldschmidt, at the University of Illinois. I'm a my undergraduate work was at the University of Illinois, and so through the alumni network, I found him, and he was an expert advise Brazil. He was a soybean, um, he was an ag economist who knew a lot about soybeans, but he knew a lot about ethanol. And he had worked with the Brazilians in, in developing the, their sugar-based ethanol business. So he was so like, I contacted him email and he was on sabbatical in, in Paris. And he was, and he was so forthright. So when he came back, I actually was paying him $250 an hour because he wouldn't even take any money. But I said, no, it's not right. I, you have to be paid. You're helping me so much. He was, he was brilliant. He, he kept me out of a lot of bad things. And when we tried to make a deal down in Texas with the, um, there's the sugar co-op down there. And they were, they had a deal to do sugar and sorghum into ethanol. And I loved it. But the deal was so good that I knew we were never going to get it because not, nothing good. If it's that good, it ain't coming out of Texas. I can news that. They don't let anybody, any outsiders get into the deal. And I was right because that deal on paper was so good. But I, I love that business. I did a lot of self-education and Peter Goldsmith helped me quite a bit. So good. I, this is a great, I love having these discussions. Thanks. Yeah, me too. Me too. I, when James and I met, I just sat there and laughed, and because he's funny, and but also learned a great deal. Oh yeah, it's I mean, one, 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 I, down here in uh, Scottsdale. One time I was in the barber shop, and I'm getting a haircut, and uh, a guy comes in. He's waiting, you know, and he's got his boots on with spurs, and I go, "Well, this is a real cowboy." So, uh, so we said, so he looks at me, he says, Hey, I know you, you're on Santelli all the time. No, he recognized you really. So we, so, you know, we were like the only two or three people in the bar that was the day after Christmas. Um, and, and I was going on Santelli. So I, it was a, a Sunday morning. So I was going on Santelli on Monday and I had to get it. My wife says, go get a haircut. So I remember Doug Bean, he had a, he had a huge, he had 3,000 uh, head uh, in Eastern Washington. So, and then he had, but he, he came down here, he had a small ranch right by where I live, about 45 acres, which is, you know, just, he would winter here. But he, uh, we were supposed to get together. He said, oh, you know, you know, come on. He said, bring your grandkids, put them on little ponies. Uh, I said, oh my God, he had to run back. That was the year that the real cold winter Really, yeah. I made 2017, and he had to go running back to uh, Washington. He said his the herd was really in danger because the weather was so cold. So we haven't got. I couldn't, to... imagine. couldn't imagine. And Rob and I have had Rob Stewart and I have, have had a lot of conversations, of, um, just you know, surrounding the same things that you guys have, and, and it's it's a it's it's foreign to me. The only thing I know about ag eggs is how to trade them. <laughs> 
you know, or how to manage risk on them. Like, you know, like Tommy Crouch would say is, you, you, you want to get long, you want to buy hogs? You think hogs are going yeah. higher? We'll get long. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. Um, any other questions, guys, before I was going to take off? Mark Wisniewski, did you have anything? Yeah, I don't even know if he's here. I will tell you, go listen to, you can go on YouTube and listen to that press conference, and, and I'm not out of my mind. No, we, we, we listened to it yesterday. I, I, I came down just a couple of minutes, literally just two or three minutes after it started. Um, and, and we were we were listening. We were all short yesterday, and it was, you know, yesterday was a lovely day. I've missed this rally today, but you know, I'm not complaining. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we were just kind of picking out, or I was picking out like the key words that I thought the algos might be reacting to. And um, uh, um, and every time that the market, you know, you, you talk about deflationary forces, or you know, there's uh, uh, years, uh, just anything that he said, sold, sold, sold. Yeah, I just mm -hmm. sat there and watched it. So I just I I missed the unemployment ten percent part and and it, it it's embarrassing that I did and I was I meant to read oh, no. I meant to read it and I didn't. It should have been headlines or really for the life of me because especially with the Biden administration in you know this is their concern listen to them this is what they're speaking to they're all on the same page here so the fact that that wasn't screamed Fed chair says you know real unemployment is. 10%. Mm. Social justice minister. There it is. All right. I love it. Listen, I love being in. Uh, you guys do a really good job. Great questions. We, I, You know, there's a lot to digest here, though. I hope I, yes, I don't know who get played up. I've been trying to keep the blog, which is why I don't write, because I get a, I said, well, what, where am I going here? What's my focus? And uh, now, now they got the gold lower. Unbelievable. Silver yeah, still I up. saw that. Silver still up ninety five cents. I I I've got two pages worth of notes, and um, I also want to read some some Graham Allison too. I'm telling you, read. He wrote articles on the society worth a read. Well, he'll be he'll be what I'm looking up. Well, thank you, Ira. Thanks again okay. for spending time with us, and I'll um uh I'll, I'll I'll contact you later on in the week. There's still some things I I've been meaning to talk to you about, um, right. and then we've got next week too. So. I'll, We'll be in, what's uh, uh, what's okay. going on with my one of my favorites, uh, Penn? Have you been in touch with Penn? Um, not since last week. Okay. I don't know what happened to her. She was she was around, and I just haven't heard. Okay, I, I send her. I'll send her. Out. I was um I, I was talking yesterday in the group about um, maybe trying to call Judd again this weekend. See see <laughs> if he's okay. over whatever it is that he's angry about. See if we can okay. start working together again. Great, because if we combine it, it's a powerful. Yes, I agree. Powerful. I agree. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Uh, love it. Yes, Ian, maybe we live in interest. I'm reading the, all the comments. Let's see. Oh, Ian's been busy. You know what? Hinkley, Ian, let me talk about Hinkley for a minute. I think the Brits made a huge mistake because they could have through using the French, absolutely had the ECB buy all the bonds that were needed to be issued to build Hinkley at 1%. I, I, I wrote about it in real time. They made a gigantic mistake, but I think people are gonna see the wisdom of Brexit. And, and I don't care one way or another. It's just that the EU could be so stifling. So that's another subject we'll get to. Uh, I'm just, okay. So all I wanted to do, uh, leave with. All right, thanks, Ira. Thank you so much, and and again, thank you for you know being part of my life. I mean, you're one hey, of the people. Because you are man, grateful for our, for our paths have crossed in so many ways. Really, it's a pleasure, and you know now I got to call Mikey Sturge because he, he's making me nuts. <laughs> Tell Mike I love him, and I'll talk to him soon. Too, I hope. You're late. I told him that yesterday. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> all right bye Ira. okay all right guys great conversation again as always and i'll see you back in hey P uh, peter do me a favor and lop out the part about judd i'll no don't worry about it i'll see you uh i'll see you guys all back in discord great conversation always great always <laughs>